Good morning and welcome to Chapel Hill. Welcome to online worship. We are Luke and Ellen Gannon. We were married here a year ago at Chapel Hill and have been attending for multiple years together now. We love our Chapel Hill family. We miss you. Welcome to Sunday morning worship. Well, thank you, Luke and Ellen, for that wonderful greeting. It's good to be gathered together in worship wherever you are. And it's good to, uh, you know, listen to my jokes. So the other day, I, was, I, I was found out this information that Google Earth, apparently now, they're saying that with Google Earth, you can read maps backwards. And I said, wow, that's, that's just spam. Get it? Maps backwards is spam. Hey, hey, haven't, you've missed those, haven't you? Well, please join me now in our call to worship. Almighty God, from the ends of the earth, you've gathered us around Christ's holy altar table. We come from north, south, east, and west to feast together. Have mercy on your universal church, troubled, divided, and weary. Renew us and make us one in Christ. Amen. Please join me in our prayer of invocation. O oh God, we join with our sisters and brothers around the world in remembering Christ's sacrifice for us, for the opportunity to eat and drink together, and for the life we've received. We give you thanks and praise. In the abundance of your many gifts, grant us grace to fill one another's lives with love. Redeem, restore, and remind us until we are made new. Transform our daily bread into the bread of life and the cup that we drink into the cup of salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. made from one blood all the families of earth the circles of nurture that raised us from birth companions who join us to walk through each stage of childhood and youth and adulthood and age then widen that wisdom and grace to include the races and viewpoints our families exclude till peace in each home bears and nurtures the bud of peace shared by all you have made from one blood thank you for that hymn are you interested in learning more about our mission? Do you have questions about membership or baptism? Join Pastor Jeff for Chapel Hill 101 via Zoom today from 4 to 5 p.m. Information about children's ministry activities, Sunday school videos, and spiritual practices for parents can be found in our e-newsletter and on our Chapel Hill Kids Facebook group. Youth are invited to join us this fall for Big Faith and Small Groups, Sunday afternoons at Chapel Hill. High school meets from 4 to 5 p.m. and middle school from 5.15 to 6.15 p.m. See you here. If you would like to receive our newsletter, please go to the link on the screen. And as always, please email joys and concerns to Reverend Jennifer Herndon. Thank you for keeping the church in your prayers and as you are able in your budget. Preparing to pray, hear the psalmist. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. God of wholeness and healing, we are a people in need of your grace. In our great diversity, bind us together with our sisters and brothers all over the world as we celebrate communion together today. Where we are hurting, comfort where we are scared, courage, where we are broken, renewal. We pray for one another now, specifically naming Yvonne Bench and her upcoming surgery, as well as Judy Miller, Paul Longhofer, Colton Hurt, and Jeff Hoig. We pray for Scott and Christy White in the death of Scott's mother. 
and we pray for those we name in our hearts. Thank you, O oh God, for loving us, for shepherding us. Thank you for Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen and amen. The gospel is according to the evangelist John. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Quartet, for that beautiful music today. We are celebrating World Communion Sunday, as you have already heard, and this is that day when we celebrate the fact that all Christians throughout the world on this day are participating in this sacred meal. So I want to talk about that today, but before I do, let's pray. Come Holy Spirit and speak to us. Come Holy Spirit and inspire us. Come Holy Spirit and challenge us. Come Holy Spirit and do what only you can do. And we'll praise your name now and forever. Amen and amen. I'm reminded about that story that you probably have heard before, but I love to tell it, about the Thanksgiving gathering of a four-generation family. And pardon the stereotypical nature of this story, I realize that it is very stereotypical, but four generations of women were in the kitchen preparing the Thanksgiving meal. I know there are many men who take on that role today. But the story is that the youngest of the women said, Grandma, why is it that we cut the ends of the ham off before placing it in the pan? Well, Grandma said, why don't you ask your great-grandma, the oldest? And she said, well, way back when, when your great-grandpa and I were just starting out, we only had one pan. And so therefore I had to cut off the ends of the ham in order for it to fit into the pan. Tradition gets passed on generation to generation. And sometimes we do things and we don't really know why, but it's really good to ask, why do we do that? So on this World Communion Sunday, I think it's important for us to ask the question, why communion? Why is it important? Why is it meaningful? Why is it significant? So today, I want to deal with the why of communion. Now, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about the institution, as we call it, of Holy Communion, where Jesus instituted this sacred meal. And those three Gospels tell us what happened on Monday, Thursday, the night before Jesus was crucified, where he, in the upper room, celebrated with his disciples the sacred meal. But it's only the Gospel of John that tells us why. The others tell us what. The Gospel of John tells us why. Why this meal is sacred. Why this meal is important. Why this meal is central to our lives as followers of Jesus. Now, this story of the why of communion takes place in Capernaum, as I've shared with you before. If we were to pronounce it correctly, it'd be Capernaum, but everybody knows it is Capernaum. This is on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. On your screen, you can see the map. We were there last fall. It's one of my favorite places to go. And you see in the screen photo that there is a synagogue. Now, this is from the fourth century, but in the first century, when Jesus was actually preaching and teaching in this synagogue, he was talking about those things that are important as we enter into life in the kingdom of God. I love to go here. Interestingly enough, Father Terry and I got in trouble with the priest who was minding the grounds of Capernaum because we used an outside chapel and evidently we were supposed to get his permission. In reality, we didn't take up an offering to give to him and oh my goodness, we got in trouble. So it's memorable to be there. But on the day in which Jesus was teaching, as recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter six, he is speaking about life in the kingdom of God life here and now. And so you can see on your screen that in the Gospel of John, there are several books called the Book of Signs. And in these books, you will see Jesus performing many acts, all of which point back to him and to the kingdom of God. So I wanna invite you to get your Bible out 
or open up your app and follow along here, chapter 6, because Jesus is teaching something very important about the why. So Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And then he goes on to say, I am the bread of life. Again, he would repeat things in order to make sure that they were hearing him. He says, your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. But this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that when you eat of it, you will not die. For I am the living bread come down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh for the life of the world. Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats of this bread will live. This is the bread that has come down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. Now, were you listening? If you were to summarize everything I read in one word, what would that one word be? Now there's a clue. There's a Greek word for this word <laughs> that I use a lot. Do you have it? It's Zoe. Now you can't say Zoe. Zoe is life as God intended it. Life, abundant life, eternal. Holy communion, Jesus is teaching us, is a sacrament of life, Zoe. Therefore, communion is special. It is sacred. It is serious. But it is never somber, or it is not holy communion, as Jesus described it. There are so many Protestants especially who think of Holy Communion as a funeral service for Jesus. No, it is a celebration of life. That's why in the communion liturgy today, as Dr. J leads us, you will hear these words, the mystery of faith we celebrate. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. John Wesley used to always say, and I love this quote, sour godliness is the devil's religion. Holy communion is a sacrament of life. It's Zoe in bread and juice or wine or whatever beverage you use. It's a sacrament of life. St. Irenaeus in the fourth century said, you want to see the glory of God. The glory of God is when a human being is fully alive, when they're full of life, life abundant, life eternal. And Jesus' point in the Gospel of John is that that life begins now. It does not begin when we die. It begins now. I'm a parent. As most of you know, our three kids are 18 and above. Our youngest is 21. And they've been teaching me about this new word that is quite hip called woke. Woke, W-O-K-E. That when a person is fully alive, they're woke. Now, Jesus is teaching us to be woke, to be alive. And how do we enter into this kind of life? Jesus is saying, I want you to eat my flesh and drink my blood. I was raised in a church, a United Methodist church. 
We took communion once a year on Good Friday. And if you were out of town for Easter weekend, you just plain missed out until the following year. But also in my church, those of us who had not yet been confirmed, we were not able to receive communion. So on the day of our confirmation on Pentecost Sunday, the very first thing we did after being confirmed is to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion. Interestingly enough, on the day of confirmation, the others didn't take com communion. They, they just watched us take communion for the first time. But Jesus is describing a sacrament of life. And that's why communion should be celebrated as often as you can. Because when you and I participate in this sacred meal, we are participating in a sacrament of life. Zoe. St. Augustine gave a definition that I love as we talk about this sacred meal and why it is a sacrament. It is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. It's an outward and visible sign. You have the outwardness of bread and juice or wine of an inward and spiritual grace. So the bread and the wine or juice point it's a sign of what God is doing invisibly in connecting us with Jesus and his life. I'll never forget the day at Catholic Care when Sister Agnes, the nun with whom we worked there, this of course is pre-COVID, one of the residents was offered communion. I always celebrate communion whenever I go once a month and Sister Agnes always carries the chalice. I carry the wafers. I dip the wafer into the chalice and then I serve them because for many of them it's too difficult. And so we came to this woman named Mabel and I said, Mabel, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And at that point, Mabel opened up her mouth enough for me to get the wafer halfway in and then she she put her teeth together and that wafer was not going down and it was not coming out. And I said, Mabel, please take the wafer in. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven for you. She just looked at me. <laughs> Sister Agnes, in her gentle yet authoritative way, got down into Mabel's ear so that she could hear and with her deep voice she said, Mabel, please take in the host. It will give you strength. Oh, Sister Agnes got it. Why do we participate in this sacred meal? It gives us strength. It infuses us with energy. It gives us what we need in order to face this day and all the days to come. That's why John Wesley did a lot of things well. He's the founder of the Methodist movement. He said, and I quote, Holy Communion is the grand channel whereby the grace of God's Spirit is conveyed to the souls of the children of God. It is an outward and visible sign of an inward and visible grace. That means that this holy meal is a way for us to experience the presence and power of God for the needs of our lives in this day and for all the days to come. Is it any wonder that John Wesley said, I hope that you will take Holy Communion as often as you can, even if it's several times a day. You cannot take communion too much. In the Orthodox tradition, Eastern Orthodoxy, I teach this in our Methodist 101 class, they look upon the sacrament as a holy mystery. And the reason they call it a holy mystery is that the word mystery in Greek means speechless, unable to adequately or fully explain, for it is an experience. I love that. That's why people will say to me, Jeff, I, I just don't think that people who don't understand communion should be taking communion. 
And my response is rather consistently the same. Well, if it's about understanding it, I'm not so sure that anybody does. We have glimpses of what it means and why it's important. But if you follow the logic that you have to understand it in order to participate in it, then people with intellectual disabilities who are unable to explain it, are they barred from it? God's grace is so powerfully at work in this sacrament that we don't have to understand it for God's grace to be effective. We don't have to understand it for God's grace to be powerful. It's a sacrament of life. One Sunday, I did what John Wesley would often do. He would say, we believe that the sacrament of life is a sacrament of God's grace coming down to us, coming into our souls, and it has the power to convert. It has the power to give assurance. It has the power to forgive. It has the power to renew. It has the power to do whatever you need God to do in your life. So I did that one Sunday. And some of you have heard me tell this story in Methodism 101. And I was out in the fellowship hall greeting people. And this woman came up to me and she said, you know, today you invited even atheists to come forward. I said, yes, I did. She said, well, that's the first time I've ever experienced that. I said, well, it's in keeping with our tradition. This idea that you have to be able to profess a lot of things before you come forward is not true to our tradition we believe that God's grace is so powerful that God can convert anyone through this sacred meal she said no I heard you she said I just want you to know I came with a friend today and out of courtesy I came along but you need to know that when I walked through the doors this morning I was an atheist but when you gave that challenge I went forward for communion and she said I just want you to know now I know what I was missing. That's the sacrament of life. (laughs) Ushering people into the kingdom of God here and now. And it's not dependent on my ability to understand it. And that's why at Chapel Hill, people of all ages are welcome to receive. People of all ages, all aspects of functioning, people with intellectual disabilities, Yes, anybody and everybody is welcome at the table of the Lord. Now, I want to give you, as I close, some things to think about. This is really important as we celebrate the sacrament of life. Are you fully alive in Christ? Are you currently experiencing the abundance of Zoe life today? Do you need a transfusion of life? I don't know about you, but I know about me. Since March with COVID, we're all being zapped of life. And one of the things I was reflecting on is that I haven't been taking communion as often. I want to suggest that all of us need to take communion more often. And when we do, what we're affirming is that we are connecting with the source of life. And that's why I want to encourage you every single time that you take the sacred meal into your body, into your soul, to say, I am forgiven. I belong to Christ. I belong to the family of God. I am empowered. I have a place at the Lord's table forever. So in a time of reflection, just ponder this painting of the Lord's Supper. And just find your place there. 
feasting with Jesus, receiving the gift of life. Amen. Well, this is World Communion Sunday, so we're celebrating communion not just with our congregation, but with the world today, so it makes it an extra special thing. So with that, would you please join me now in the prayer known as the Great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You've made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Jesus who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today, his family in all the world is joining at his holy table. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by His blood. Renew our communion with Your church throughout the world and strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in Your name. By Your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at His heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ, shed for you.
Let's pray. Almighty God, we give thanks that You have joined us with You, the universal Christ who transcends all time and space and boundaries. We are one in You. May this meal commemorate that and make it a reality in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining us today for online worship. I will be talking about the sacrament of life again in my vlog this week, which will appear in the e-newsletter. I hope you will join us again next Sunday at 9.30 or 11 or on YouTube after the morning services. So receive this benediction, please. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us and grant us his peace. Amen. Go with the wind at your back and the sun on your face with the song in your heart and the promise of grace. Go in peace and in truth and let love lead your way. Go with God. Go with God. Go with the wind at your back and the sun on your face with the song in your heart. The promise of grace going